Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O'Culture, where our magical system of choice is and has always been the Watchmen. If you don't get that now, give it about 50 minutes. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening, wherever you're listening, however you're listening. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. I hope I caught you in the midst of any supermoon preparations you may be making this weekend. Hey, hey, you don't have to stop what you're doing on my account. Keep on keeping on, but let me just slide this sonically transmitted discourse into those ear holes for a few moments. I mean, you like pop culture, right? And you like magic, right? And you want to know how you can merge the two together to create a workable magical system, right? Okay, okay. Now we're getting somewhere. But why don't we stimulate our magical feel spot and let our guest Taylor Elwood tell us a bit about how to create our own pop culture magic system. Sound good? Hey, we'll even throw a little space-time magic in to heighten that sensation. Hey, 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 ease up, sit back, relax. Let's strip this pod down and cast it off into a magical world built entirely on your favorite fantasy. Enjoy. Taylor Elwood, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem, man. No problem. So I guess before we get into pop culture magic, tell us, you know, the details, the the where's and the when's of, of how you first came to know this magical world that we live in and what made you want to pursue it to the level you have. Uh, sure. Well, I, so I, uh, I've always had an interest in magic. I mean, I, I think I, I can look back to as far as I've been alive and I remember, you know, reading the Greek myths by Robert Graves and the and the the Aeneid uh, by Virgil and and then later on, you know, getting into Tolkien and and then reading other fantasy books and always being fascinated with with magic and 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 uh, gods and spirits and things like that. I didn't start formally practicing magic until I was 16 because I didn't know that any of it was actually real. I mean, I thought, oh, you know, hey, this is interesting stuff. If it was real, it'd be cool. And then one day, you know, I had this kid sit me down and he uh, he told me how he, he'd, he'd noticed I'd been reading fantasy books. So he told me how he had had an astral projection experience because he was trying to see if he could freak me out. So the last thing he expected was that I would look at him calmly and say to him, tell me more. And so uh, he he ended up bringing in some books and pamphlets the next day, and I read those and and did the exercises in them and wanted to learn more. And that's how I got into magic. And then uh, you know I've just always had a fascination with it. So it's it's kind of one of those things where I'm always looking to learn more and test test my understandings of it and try different things out. And that's really what shapes my work at Magical Experiments, which is my website, and uh, really just what shapes my philosophy with magic overall it's it's always it's really about just discovering what magic can do and seeing how it can be mixed and matched with different disciplines and cultures and practices and things like that in order to get results and do other fun things <laughs> yeah and it's interesting too you know, like you're, you're writing about pop culture magic here and and obviously that plays such a a huge role in all of our lives, especially when we're young, you know, we're introduced to movies and books and comics and TV shows and things like that. What role did the pop culture specifically have on you in your youth? And do you look back on that? And do you see that as really like your first introduction to magic? So I would say that for me, it definitely played a role in my life. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I started reading the Greek myths and uh, and Virgil the Aeneid. And of course, I read different fantasy books and things like that. And that, and that was what really prompted my interest in magic, because you know, reading these these stories about different characters and how they would use magic to solve things or to have some kind of situation come up was was fascinating to me. And so um uh, I, I would say that, that pop culture has always played a pivotal role in my life. I mean, it's something that I, I even to this day, you know, it's it's something that fascinates me and interests me. I'm always reading some type of fantasy or science fiction book or sometimes a mystery book, along with other things that I'm reading, or I'm watching different shows or, or other things along those lines. So it's it's very much a, it, it plays a very pivotal role in, in my life and certainly in my spiritual work because you know, I've looked at pop culture over the years and I've said, okay, well, how could I turn this into a viable magical system or a viable magical working? And, you know, not, not all pop culture necessarily lends itself that way, but a lot of it does. Or, you know, I would say it's to put it a different way, I would say that, you know, you can take pretty much any pop culture and turn it into a magical working. But I would say that it, you also want to be picky and choosy. We can talk about that a bit later. But 
it's one of those things where I, I would say that, that one of the things that drew me to the idea of using pop culture with magic was the idea of finding stuff that was relevant to me. Because, you know, as I got into magic and started learning more about it, one of the things that really stood out to me is that a lot of times, you know, you'd read these books and you'd have this stuff where, OK, you're going to work with this Celtic deity or this Norse deity or whatever else. And a lot of times I'd be like, you know, that's just fascinating stuff. It's cool, but it I don't really relate to it, and I don't know that really relates to what's going on in the world around me. I mean, you know, there's there's just so many things that have that are so, that are so different in some ways when it comes to modern context, and where I found that modern context was pop culture. Yeah, for sure. I think we could all look back, and I guess depending on what type of pop culture you consume. It is, to me, I think, the introduction that we all get to this magical world, you know? Like, I, okay, so for example, I finished your book yesterday, and then last night after I finished it, I watched Wonder Woman. So I'm sitting here watching, you know, and, and I don't know if you've seen this film or know this story from the film that they put out this year, but it's rooted in Greek myth, right? So, which is yeah. Like your, yeah, so, and I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, well, you know, here's gods and magic, like using magic, and kids that watch this don't realize that they're being sort of... I don't want to say indoctrinated because that's sort of a negative word, but they're being introduced at the least to these magical principles through these these comic book films, just, you know, to name one thing. Or if you go to something like the Harry Potter universe, you know, like you're <laughs> knee deep in the occult with those kinds of stories. So I haven't read your previous books on the subject, so my apologies, but I do want to point them out. You introduced the concept, I believe, in a book called Creating Magical Entities, right? Well, I uh, in Creating Magical Entities, I wrote a little bit about how you could work with pop culture um, entities. And uh, so, so, yeah, I introduced some of it there. And then in Pop Culture Magic, the first book, that's where I really just wrote an entire book about my own experiments with pop culture magic and shared, you know, the core theories and practices and what people could do with it. And then um, since that time, I've put out a couple of anthologies called the Pop Culture Grimoire and the Pop Culture Grimoire 2.0, which feature other people's work with pop culture magic and some of the things they've done. And then, of course, my uh, other book, Pop Culture Magic 2.0, where I basically shared further experiments and workings and ideas and theories and practices evolving Evolving what I'd shared in the first pop culture magic, you know, just showing basically here, here's where I am a decade later. And here's some of the things that I've worked with since then, since I wrote the original book. And then, of course, pop culture magic systems is really a, a, a book about how to create a viable magical system using pop culture. And it was it was prompted in part by, you know, as I was finishing up Pop Culture Magic 2.0, I wrote a chapter on how to create a magical system with pop culture. And it was a good chapter, but I realized there was a lot more that there was a lot more depth I could go into. And so it became its own book. Yeah. So take us back to the origin story, if you will, of this. Like, when did you first, I guess, have the idea that working with pop culture was a viable system of magic? And what was the first system that, that you created with it? It's kind of an interesting question because when I think about it, I you know I see I see you know certain things that I read where I can say now in retrospect that they certainly influenced my understanding. So I'm gonna purchase from a two pronged approach. So first, you know, as I was reading books by say like Michael Moorcock, for example, and reading the Elric series or reading the Deathgate the Deathgate series cycle by. Um, Margaret Wise and Tracy Hickman, one of the things that would happen is that sometimes these authors would describe the way that the magic worked in some detail, whether it was through a scene in the book or in like in the case of the Deathgate cycle, they actually had appendices where they were writing about, you know, here's here's the way the magic's supposed to work in this world. And so I would read stuff like that and I and I realized that it it subtly influenced my understanding and approach to magical work because I had read that and, and it made sense to me. And, you know, I'd come back to it later and I'd come back to those books later on after I'd started practicing magic and I'd be like, you know, there's something in here that really makes sense, especially when I compare it to what I already know and what's been described in the various um, magical books. And But I would say that um, in terms of just like the overt realization about pop culture, it, it happened in, in like 1997, 1998. Yeah, 1998. And um, at the time I was uh, I was watching this anime show called Dragon Ball Z. It was on Cartoon Network at the time. 
I thought it was really fascinating because, you know, you had these characters who were doing this amazing energy work and, and flying around and throwing chi balls and all this other stuff. And I, I thought it was pretty cool. And at the time, I had just started getting into energy work and, and breathing practices. So as I watched the show, I started paying attention to the explanations they had for why people were able to do the various techniques. Because one of the things that would happen is that sometimes in the show, they would provide a somewhat technical explanation for what they were doing and, and how, how they did what they could do. And I thought that was fascinating. So then I started to ask myself, well, is there any basis to this? You know, is there any way that I could take what this show's talking about and actually apply it to what I'm trying to do with energy work? And that's really how I started getting into pop culture magic, because after I tried that out and I found that, OK, there's there's something here. It's not it hasn't resulted in me flying around. I'm not throwing visible chi balls, but there's something here to what they're saying. That's when I started looking at other pop culture and asking myself, well, how can I take this and adapt it to you know, magical work. How can I how can I take what I see in pop culture and turn it into viable workings? And I would say in terms of an actual system that, you know, that didn't happen until maybe a few years later, because, you know, I, I first started out doing what I'd call a lot of one off pop culture workings. You know, I'd work with a pop culture and try something out and I'd be like, OK, I'm going to move on to the next thing. But I started to develop a system actually with Harry Potter because, you know, there was there was some really interesting explanations of how magic works and also because I found, OK, I can connect with the these characters as spirits and work with them as well and so i started to i started to develop that and that was that was actually probably like in 2000 that i started that in fact i wrote about it in creating magical entities how i one of the projects that i did was i created a um or rather i connected with the harry potter entity and and set it up um, with a specific purpose because at the time Christians were really freaking out about the movies and so I was like and, and their fear was that it would promote interest in the occult and so I thought well why don't we take what they're afraid of and take their actual fear and turn it into fuel that feeds into manifesting the very thing they're afraid of and you know promoting interest in the occult and getting people more interested and and you know I, I was kind of like all right let's see if I can work with the spirit of Harry Potter and and make that happen you know since Harry Potter was the the embodiment of that and I created a collage at the time and and did a, a path working to Harry Potter and then I had a, a group of people test it out and and you know we found that it seemed to work and so it was it was one of those cases where then I was like all right let's start looking into more of this and so I started re you know as I read the rest of the Harry Potter books I ended up coming up with some different rituals and practices and and, you know, some of it was practical magic and some of it was more devotional or theurgic in nature as opposed to the, the practical or thaumaturgic aspects. So, you know, there was kind of a balance of that. And, and that was kind of the, the first proto that was, that was the first system that I started to develop. And of course, I've continued doing that work since then uh, with other pop culture as well. So I think that we would both agree that creating art is is a form of magic in and of itself. And so when you have a piece of art out there like the Harry Potter universe that a bunch of people really identify with it, they really take to it, they make it even maybe part of their lifestyles and not just in a magical way, but just in general, you know, they live and breathe that, they buy the books, they watch the movies, they have decorations and costumes and whatever else. Are we bordering on Harry Potter and its characters becoming like the idea of maybe an egregore? You know, what I found is that I would I would argue that Harry Potter and and really just um you know and any pop culture that has a sufficient amount of attention coming toward it already is basically an egregore. Now the people may not be intentionally working with Harry Potter or you know or or anything along those lines but they're fans. You know, they're reading the books, they're watching the movies. Um or like in the case of the Marvel universe or Justice League, it's the same kind of kind of thing. They're reading the comic books, they're they're you know, they're watching the movies, they're they're talking about this pop culture. They're going in and, and, and cosplay or whatever else. And so it's it's one of those things where all of that attention basically feeds those pop culture spirits. And then of course, you know, you do have people who are intentionally working with them. And so of course that also contributes to that that kind of life. I mean really the way that I look at it is that pop culture is is modern mythology. You know, and that what we're dealing with are the modern gods. It's it's not really all that different from classic mythology or anything like that. I mean, I, I suppose the main difference is that 
you know, the, the form that it takes, the media that's used is about, is, is really about the only thing that's, that's different when it comes to the interaction or what people are doing. But at the end of the day, in some form or another, people are engaging with, connecting with, and in some ways worshiping the pop culture that they're into. And that's what makes it uh, a viable spiritual contact and a way to work with, uh, you know, the spirits that are embodied. Yeah. And this seems like a, a natural outgrowth of chaos magic. Well, yeah, it, it, it is in some ways. I mean, uh, you, you know, if you look at if you look at the origins of pop culture magic, it, pop, pop culture magic basically started with chaos magic. I'm not going to say that it, it's one and the same because it's become its own thing. And of course, there are, you know, there, you know, there are some people who practice chaos magic who do pop culture magic, but there are other people who have never done chaos magic and practice pop culture magic. So I think they are two di- separate and distinct things. But it's also fair to say that, that chaos magic certainly played a role in, in helping pop culture magic become what it is. Well, do chaos magicians or even just regular magicians like what what's their opinion of pop culture magic in general? Well, I mean, I, I you know, some people some people like it and practice it. Other people don't think it's uh, don't think it's viable and, uh, y- you know, think it's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't pay much attention to the latter. Um, but the people who are interested in it, you know, there's well, I have a, a Facebook group called Pop Culture Magic. We have over 600 members in there. And of course, there's a very active uh, community on uh, the Tumblr social media site. And, uh, you, you know, so I think I think it's one of those cases where, you, you know, just depends. I mean, if it's something that resonates with you, you'll practice it. If it's something that doesn't resonate with you, then you'll just kind of go and do your own thing. And, uh, you know, that's okay. Yeah. And I had a, a quote here that I pulled out of your book that I wanted you to maybe touch on what exactly you meant by it. But you wrote that, quote, I feel that we mustn't discard the culture, technology and times we live in simply because they aren't automatically part of what we'd find in esotericism. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that people tend to have a an approach to magic. A lot of people have a tendency to rever what's older. You know, if it's if something's old or traditional or whatever in magic, well, we can practice that. You know, I certainly see that with with a lot of uh, a lot of people. And and I and I think you know, hey, there's there's nothing wrong with uh, with honoring with what's come before and and working with it. But I think. That when we discard the, the that when we focus on that to the exclusion of the times that we live in, we're ignoring something fundamental to those times and the need for magic in those times. And at the same time, I mean, I, I I would I would also conversely say that you know we shouldn't we shouldn't ignore our roots or forget forget the foundation. I mean, you know you know I didn't just start practicing pop culture magic when I first started practicing magic. I you know I had to learn I had to learn different magical practices and. And, uh, you know, spend get get some experience with them before I started developing pop culture magic. So, you know, that's important to remember, too. But for myself, I've always looked at modern technology and, and, and modern culture as something to be embraced and worked with. And, and I sometimes find that uh, other magicians don't feel that way. You know, they tend to be like, well, no, it, if it's not classic or traditional, we shouldn't do it. And, you know, hey, to each their own choice. But. When you're fundamentally rejecting something because it, it, it doesn't have a certain amount of age to it, it's you're in a sense you're rejecting a part of yourself as well. And rejecting the fact that you live in the here and now and that there are certain things where there are certain things where it might be useful to adapt what we have around us to address those situations, spiritually or otherwise. So for me that's really what I'm getting at when I talk about that, because Magic that does not evolve is not magic that's going to stay relevant in the long term. You know, if if all we ever do is practice the grimoires or 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 try to replicate, you know, the older cultures and their spiritual practices, we're missing out on continuing to make magic relevant in the here and now. And at some point, it just it won't be relevant. And I and I look at pop culture and I see how in and of itself, pop culture continues to challenge what we know about magic and make it relevant. And yeah, maybe is it silly? Is it fantasy fiction, etc.? It is. But at the same time, it challenges us to look at magic with fresh eyes. And that's one of the reasons why I think magic continues to persist because we have pop culture and because people fundamentally in general have an interest in empowering themselves. And magic is one of the routes to doing that. And so that's why they're so fascinated with magic. Yeah, and I think I would look at magic in the same way that that I personally look at art, where all the stories in the history of the world have already been told. It's just, you know, if you want to create one of your own, that's what you have to do. You, you take what's already been done 
and then you make it your own somehow. And I, I think that that's what you're getting at here with magical systems is that it's okay to to learn the lessons of years past and all the, the, the magic that's come before you. But I think the mark of, a to me, a, a true magician is somebody who can take that and make it his own. I think so, yeah. I mean, you know, it, my approach to magic is really that you, you ultimately want to personalize magic. And what I mean by that is that you do want to make it your own. You want to make it into something that really speaks to who you are and, and what you need and, and, and what you need and, 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 and the challenges that you face in life, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that personalization ultimately is about making magic relevant to you. When I talk about relevancy, really what I'm talking about is that it has to have some type of meaning. So if somebody comes up to you and says, well, you have to practice magic this way, and that's not relevant to you, are you going to practice magic? No, you're not. Um, or, or you may try, but then you're going to get discouraged because it doesn't resonate with you. And, I, I mean, what's the point of having a spiritual practice of any type if it's not something that doesn't speak to us in some way that's meaningful to us? You know, if we're told that we have to do things a certain way and we're never offered any other way or we're told that any other way or exploration isn't real magic or whatever else, then what we're discouraging is is, is the person's experiences and their attempts to discover who they are through their spiritual work. But we're also discour discouraging the evolution of magic. I would think, too, that you don't want magic to become dogmatic. You don't want it to become religion because that's essentially what it's there to sort of counteract. Exactly. Exactly. And so when people make magic into dogma, they're, they're actually turning into the very thing we don't want it to become, religion. And that's not useful at all. Definitely not, man. So, and you mentioned this uh, a couple minutes ago in one of your answers. You said that you wouldn't recommend pop culture magic to someone who doesn't already have an understanding of how magic works. And I think it's probably uh, self-explanatory as to why. But then you also wrote in your book that spiritual development and critical thinking are important in this as well. So I was wondering what you meant by that actually, and, and why are these two things so important? So I was talking about spiritual discernment and critical thinking. You know, here's, here's the thing about any practice of magic. When you're practicing magic, you know, I, I think it's important to maintain a certain level of skepticism with what you're doing, and that's where the critical thinking comes into play and the spiritual discernment. You know, spiritual discernment is really about, okay, if I'm connecting with a, a spirit, you know, is, is, is this a healthy relationship? Or am I putting myself into a situation where I'm doing things or, 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 or things are happening in a way that it's unhealthy for me? Am I in a situation where there's unreasonable expectations being put upon me? Um, and, do, and do I think that they're unreasonable? Or am I putting myself into a situation where I'm, I'm doing wish fulfillment, where, you know, it's more about the fact that I really want to connect with that spirit and, and become its lover or whatever else, which some people do. And because it's it, that's what it's really about for me, as opposed to doing a genuine spiritual practice. You know, what's the underlying motivation? That's what spiritual discernment asks and gets us to explore from both sides of the equation when it comes to the relationships that we might have with a given spirit. With critical thinking, it really just comes right down to to maintaining that kind of the, the necessary skepticism that, that should come into play with doing spiritual work. That we don't just necessarily buy the farm wholesale, but that we, we look over everything and that we, we, we challenge and test our assumptions. And that if we've done a magical working, we don't automatically assume that just because things have come together, that it's just because of the magical working. We really take a look at it and we, we rigorously test that against you know the experiences that we've had and also looking at the different variables that are at work. So that's what I mean by that. And part of that can only happen by actually going and and doing the necessary um, foundational work, you know, going and learning magic. And that's why I don't recommend pop culture magic to somebody who's just starting out, because a lot of times when someone's just starting out, magic's that new, it's, it's the new shiny object, right? And it's exciting and everything else. And what ideally needs to occur is that the person needs to achieve a, you know, discipline with what they're doing. And, and that only happens by going out there and doing learning the magical practices from the ground up you know not just going into something and saying okay well i want to be a pop culture magician so i'm going to go out there and do some stuff with harry potter but i don't have any real basis or foundation in magic so i don't know for sure whether or not this is working that that's just wish fulfillment at that point you know whereas if you've actually done magical work if you've 
developed a, a daily practice, if you've been consistent with what you're doing and you've tested the things that you're trying, that in and of itself plays a role in the work that you're doing and it prepares you to ask the necessary questions and test your assumptions and develop a rigorous magical practice. So that's what I mean by that kind of stuff because without that that rigor in place, I think that it just leads to situations where where people get focused more on the wish fulfillment than anything else. You know, they're, oh, you know, it's not necessarily about doing the work. And and honestly, in some ways, I'm going to say this because it's, it's it's absolutely true and it's not said enough, but magic's hard. You know, magic isn't, isn't just a, oh, you know, we're just going to make our life go smooth. I mean, you, you know, just because you practice magic, it doesn't automatically make all your problems get solved or anything else like that. It's a spiritual path. It's a spiritual practice. Can you use it to get results? Sure, you can definitely use it to get results. But even when you get those results, you have to weigh in, okay, am I ready to handle the consequences of that result? Or, you know, am I am I being completely 100 percent honest with myself about what the motivation is or are there any is there anything that's going to factor in and play a role in that? So magic isn't isn't something to just be done lightly. It's something that that, you know, if you're going to do it, you you really need to know that that, you know, it, it requires some real work. And I don't necessarily see that said all that often in, in most of the books that are out there. You know, of course, you know, they're trying to sell sell books and, and you know, get people on board. But I, I think it's worth saying, because if you're going to practice magic, it's it's not going to always be fun and, and everything else. I mean, there's there's days where I don't want to do my daily magical work or whatever else, but I make myself do it because it's not about doing it for the for the fun of it. It's about doing it because it has some type of meaning to me and because it's something that I want to engage in and because it's a way for me to understand and connect with the world. Let me ask a, a dumb <laughs> sort of layman's question here, but what's wrong with wish fulfillment? Is that something that just, is that not a positive thing if I can make my own wishes come true? Well, we have to look at what, when, when I talk about wish fulfillment, what I'm really talking about is, is, isn't necessarily making your wishes come true, but rather deluding yourself into believing that something is what it isn't. So I'll use an example here, um, and I mentioned it, I think, in the Pop Culture Magic Systems book. I certainly mentioned it in other books. At one point, um, are you familiar with Final Fantasy VII? Yes, I am. Okay, so, so you know, of course, there's this one character in there called Sephiroth. He's the main bad guy. And at one point, I was, I was doing some some research on pop culture stuff, and I came across this online community of people who worship Sephiroth. And I thought it was interesting, so I, I hung around for a little bit. And, and basically, all these people were talking about how they were married to Sephiroth and how they were having hot, sweaty, astral sex with Sephiroth, you know? Getting the astral hickeys on and all that other fun stuff. Well, it's a good-looking character. I mean... Yeah, it's a good-looking character, but what stood out to <laughs> me about it was that, you know, in one sense, we say, oh, that's wish fulfillment. There's nothing wrong with that. But what stood out to me was that, I mean, here's this character that's cruel and manipulative and basically wants to destroy the world and has some serious mom issues, too. And, you know, these people are like, oh, I'm all into that. And and it just struck me as fundamentally unhealthy because all of them were the focus wasn't on doing magical work. It was about having this 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 relationship with Sephiroth. And in some ways, it, it seemed like these people weren't able to engage with each other without it being about Sephiroth, but weren't able to engage with the world at large. And that's kind of what I mean by wish fulfillment. It becomes its own form of delusion. It becomes more about satisfying some type of egoistic urge as opposed to really doing the magical work. And so it's, it's, it's not necessarily based on reality. And of course, we can say, well, magic's supposed to alter reality, Taylor, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons we practice it. But the whole point is that you're still dealing with reality. And so, I mean, there's a very there's a very distinct difference between, you know, doing a magical practice in order to bring a possibility into reality and uh, doing a magical practice where it becomes more about living a fantasy than it does about engaging with everyday life. And, w- and whether we like it or not, we do live in the world at large. And, you know, we all have we all have our, our things that we have to deal with and, and work through and that that's why I have the concern about wish fulfillment and, and what I mean by wish fulfillment. I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with doing magic to get practical results in our lives and to make changes um, in our lives. I think, you know, I, I've certainly done it enough and still do it on occasion and other people do as well. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very different thing from wish fulfillment. Wish fulfillment to me really is about, you know, getting so wrapped up in the fantasy of something that that becomes the reality and you're not able to deal with the real world as it were. And that's that's not a good thing to be 
that's in my opinion that's not a good thing to happen in your spiritual practice <laughs> yeah i would think so too and sephiroth by the way a, a nice reference to the kabbalah right to the tree of life well i mean in i mean final fantasy 7's reference to that really isn't even based off of that that's the weird thing about that because it's like oh yeah that's uh what do we really mean by that like are, are you know Sephiroth is the name of character. It's not actually dealing with the actual Sephiroth in the Tree of Life. So <laughs> I sometimes find some of the pop culture references to be kind of hilarious because they'll they'll cherry pick something from esotericism or something like that, and they'll be like, "Ooh, you know, we're going to use the name Se- we're going to use Sephiroth, the, the term Sephiroth, and name it to a character." And it's like, "Okay, great, but what does that have to do with Kabbalah? Nothing. They just basically <laughs> culturally appropriated it." Well, yeah, that seems to be a uh, a popular thing these days. So you have a, a great section in the book where you outline the difference between a system and a tradition of magic. And I was wondering if you don't mind telling the audience, you know, what the major difference is between those things. So a tradition is is essentially, um, it is a magical system, but it's a magical system that's been, that's been practiced for generations. Basically, you know, whoever first came up with it is more than likely dead. Or if they are alive, they've been alive, they've had at least a couple generations of people who've practiced it. It's, it's usually a continuation of a very specific spiritual path or, or, or vision, as it were. So, so, for example, I have a tradition that I, I practice that I'm, I'm part of called the uh, Temple of Inner Convocation. And, you know, when I trace it back, there's a, there's a distinct spiritual lineage that's at work that goes back a few generations. And, it's magical work that's been done over those generations and it's kind of built its own momentum. And, you know, some of the practices have evolved or changed with the time and are, are continuing to, but it has a very distinct lineage that plays a role in making it what it is. A system is something, is basically something that someone has created and they're still alive. They don't necessarily have you know, a couple generations of people uh, coming after them who've continued to evolve that system or anything else. It's it's something that's been created, um, and you know, in the here and now, relatively speaking. And it's it's something that's just just starting out. And I don't call it tradition because there isn't that lineage. There aren't necessarily the the same type of spiritual connections at work as of yet because it's you're still very much in a discovery phase. Whereas with a tradition, you know, the, the discovery has happened. There's continuing work that's occurring but there's also there's there's a a deeper spiritual connection at work in that tradition that's carrying it forward and it it, it doesn't necessarily mean that a tradition is better than a system um, that's not I, I i don't want people to get that sense from that that's not the case at all it's just that a tradition has that distinct distinct reality that it's been around for a while and that there has been a continue a, a, that there have been people who've been carrying that work forward whereas with a system a system a system of magic is basically just has just been developed it's just getting started you know it, it may or may not last a few generations you know i mean time will tell on that front and so it's I, I think it's worthwhile to make that kind of distinction because a lot of times people will talk about, oh, I'm, you know, I have I've, I've created this tradition. And it's like, well, you've only been practicing magic for five years. It's not a tradition. It's not something that has been around for that all that long. And, and, and again, you know, really come it. Part of this really just comes right down to how a particular word is used. So, you know, when you read a book on magic and they're talking about a spiritual tradition, that's what they're referring to. And that's why I think it's important to make that kind of distinction. You know, what I'm teaching in pop culture magic systems is really how to create a system. It's not how to how to develop a pop culture magic tradition. I mean, maybe by the time I'm, you know, old and 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 decrepit and, you know, all that stuff, there will be some pop culture magic traditions. But um, it's, it's going to be a while yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was also wondering, too, one thing that you touched on that I think would also be useful to the audience is the value of correspondences uh, as it relates to not just magic, I guess, but pop culture magic. And I was wondering if you could, I guess, first of all, just give us a brief explanation of, of what a correspondence is as it relates to magic and then touch on a little bit of what you did in the book in terms of its value. Sure. So if you open up a a number of different books on magic, you'll often see correspondence charts. Now, I will say that the the one problem that I have with, with so many of those books is that they don't really do a good job of explaining the value of those correspondence charts and why you should even care about them. 
And, and part of that's because I think in a lot of ways, people don't have a full understanding of what a correspondence chart is. So a correspondence chart isn't just a, a, an, a, list, a, a list of associations like, you know, OK, here's the element of fire and it's linked to this and it's linked to this deity and it's linked to this tool and it's linked to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most people, that's what they think of when they see a correspondence chart. That's how I used to think of them, too. And so a lot of times I wouldn't even pay attention to them. It wasn't until a couple of years ago when I was actually um, in a workshop with with one of my mentors, um, and he was talking about he was talking about correspondences that I really began to understand what a correspondence actually is. The correspondence isn't a list of of relationships in a book. A correspondence is something that you personally develop as a result of the spiritual work that you're doing. And so, if you're if you're working with an archangel, as an example. Let's say you're working with the Archangel Ariel. You're in that in that work. One of the things that you're going to do is you're going to start you're, you're going to start to create correspondences or connections with certain things that represent that that help to embody and connect you to that Archangel. So, in case of our Ariel, it might be you know a, um, a pentacle, right? Um, and and Earth and um, the the energies of destruction and regeneration. And so those are those are associations that are going going to come about because you've done some some spiritual work, you've done some path working, you've you've gotten to know RAL and you've discovered those things that he's connected to and that he uh, mediates and represents. And so that's really how a correspondence chart is supposed to be developed. It's it's developed off of your personal work with the spirits that you work with. And so by extension, with, with pop culture magic, if you're going to create a pop culture magic system and you're starting to work with the pop culture spirits, one of the things that you want to be thinking about is or, or, or looking to discover is, you know, what what do these spirits represent? What do they embody? What do they mediate? And, you know, how how does that help me to connect to to what they represent i mean really in one sense if we look at spirits you know a spirit is is designed to when i talk about the word mediate a spirit's designed to to mediate to represent a primal energy that a person wants to work with and what it's doing is it's making sure that you are getting access to that energy but in a way that is safe for you because the spirit can handle that energy in a different way than you can that's kind of the advantage that's the advantage that a spirit has over uh, a person the advantage that a person has over a spirit is that we have material form where we're embodied and we have flesh and so we're able to do things with the physical world that a spirit wouldn't be able to do as an interesting aside now when it comes to the, the, the pop culture correspondences it's it's basically operating on the same principle so if i'm going to work with harry potter you know an initial an initial easy correspondence is going to be house gryffindor and bravery and, uh, you know, other things along those lines that are associated with that because he's a member of House Gryffindor. But then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to start looking at some of the other things that he might embody. Like he might embody the element of, of fire or, or he, might, he might embody, you know, the element of magic or, or something else along those lines. And so it's discovering those correspondences and then testing them by actually working with the spirit to discover whether or not there's any truth to that. You know, is this accurate? Let's test this and verify. And so that's what I mean by creating correspondences. You mentioned too in the book that you know someone who developed a correspondence list based on chess. I thought that sounded really cool. Do you remember what exactly that was like? Well, uh, the, the person in question has um, had developed a, a system of working with the Goetia and matched it to, so he worked with seven Goetic spirits and he matched those spirits to the chess pieces. And so he had a Goetic spirit that basically connected to, pawn, to, to the pawn pieces of chess and then another that connected to the knight pieces, bishop, so on and so forth. He basically ended up using the rules of chess, applying the rules of chess to the spiritual relationships and, and creating a correspondence from that. So, you know, what what one goetic spirit's purpose or role might be on the chessboard would be different from another. And so they would support each other in different ways and interact in certain ways. And so that was basically what was at work with that particular system. I just thought that was really cool and I, I'm not creative enough to come up with something like that myself but I just thought that was a, a, a really creative system to come up with and I was wondering what are the essential structures of a or for a magical system here 
You know, the essential structures for a magical system. Well, first of all, you got to pick a pop culture that you're going to work with. And a good question you want to ask is if that pop culture has any existing ideas or thoughts about magic in it. You know, some pop culture does, some doesn't. And I, I, I'm not I won't say that if a pop like I wouldn't say that if a pop culture doesn't have anything to say about magic or doesn't have its own explanation that it automatically rules it out. Far from it. If, if anything, it means that you kind of have um, it actually gives you a bit more freedom in some ways. Whereas if you have a, a pop culture that has some specific ideas about how magic works, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you agree with that particular stance? Is that something that that you really is, is that something that you want to bring into play with your magical work? For example, I use the show Once Upon a Time. In the show Once Upon a Time, the, one of the core beliefs about magic is that if you do magical workings, there's always a price that you have to pay. And usually the price that you pay is is, is something you don't want to pay. It's, it's not something that you necessarily want to pay. So for myself, I would never work with with Once Upon a Time as a pop culture for, for magic because that's not something I would really want to bring into my magical work. You might say, well, why can't you just why can't you just not, you know, bring that into play? And my answer to that would be if something is written into the canon of a pop culture, you know, an explanation of magic or something like that, I, you, you can't just I mean, I guess you can try and cherry pick it out. But I think I find I would find that the pop culture spirits tend that, that are part of that would tend to be resistant to it because it's something that's embedded into the DNA of of what they are. And how that shows up in the way they work with people. So you're saying that if you want to work with a specific pop culture universe, for example, that, that already has magic in it, that you have to abide by the rules of magic in that system? I, I'm saying that if you're going to work with one, you have to ask yourself if that's something that you want to really accept. Because I think it's going to play a role in your magical work, whether you want it to or not. Because you have to remember that it's, it's not a one-way street here. You know, some people think it's a one-way street with with magic. It's like, oh, I'm in control, I, but it's not. I mean, if you're working with, you know, spirits or whatever else, it's it's a two-way street. It's a relationship. And when you have certain fundamental rules written into how the magic of a given pop culture universe works, then then that's something that you're gonna have to look at and ask yourself: Is that something I want to accept and work with? And if you do, hey, great. And, and don't get me wrong, there are there are some that can be um, fairly useful. I, I like Harry Potter's, for example, because it's actually fairly fluid. You know, there's there's not it, it's something that's very open to interpretation, which makes it very workable. But I don't like Once Upon a Time because Once Upon a Time isn't open to interpretation. It's basically like, hey, if you're going to do magic, you're going to have to pay a price. It's like, okay, so if I'm going to work with, say, Rumpelstiltskin from Once Upon a Time, do I really want to pay that price? Because that's the expectation that's going to come into play. And that price is usually going to be something I don't want to pay because, because of course, it's going to be something where he's basically angling to to get an advantage over me because that's that's the nature. He's a trickster spirit. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's something where you can't just say, oh, well, Rumpelstiltskin won't be that way. Mm-hmm. I can just cherry pick that out. It, it doesn't work that way. If you're going to develop a pop culture magic system, choose carefully, choose wisely. Don't go in on the assumption of I can just go and, and cherry pick things out the way that I want them to be, you know, because there's going to be some pushback on that. And again, this is why if you sometimes doing uh, pop culture magic with, say, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or, you know, um, with with Transformers or something else is a bit better because there's no overt magical system at work there. There's no description of how magic should or ought to, or ought to work so that, you know, you kind of have you have a lot more flexibility in that way in in designing that in my opinion and and certainly I've seen that with other people so we have that aspect at work and then the other thing that that we want to we want to consider is what magical practices do we have that we want to draw on our, ourselves or what 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 practices do we want to take and adapt to that pop culture so for example storm constantine and i in, in developing the system of dahara one of the things that we did is we built a in, in the first um Grimoire. We built out a a uh, basically a correspondence with the the wheel of the year, you know, with the different the different sabbats and stuff. And that was more Storm's work than mine, but it was one of those things that because of her background that that worked really well. And so she took that foundational knowledge that she had and and adapted it to the pop culture system that we were creating, so that that pop culture system would have its own specific holidays and practices around the wheel of the year. Um, so that's another example, again, where we're, we're taking something that from 
from, in this case, magic, from the foundation of magic that we have and adapting it to and, and adapting pop culture to it and creating something that is distinctly a pop culture magic system that it's own. So those are those are kind of the factors to be thinking about when you're developing a pop culture magic system. You may have already answered this, but I want to ask it anyways. How do you identify the right piece of pop culture to work with? Because obviously different pieces of pop culture will speak to different people, but is there some basic principles or criteria that might make certain pop culture better or uh, maybe more suitable? I shared the one criteria, which is you look at you know whether or not there's a actual an explanation for how magic works in that pop culture. So there's there's that um, to think about. But I think I think really what it comes right down to ultimately is you know do you do you connect with the pop culture? You know, is it something that resonates with you? Is it something that you're willing to work with? And I want to be very clear here. I mean, if you're, it, it, there's there's a real difference between doing a pop culture magic one time around, like just coming up with a one-off working, and then or or, or just choosing to work with a, a system, choosing to develop a system of, of pop culture magic. The system is going to be a lot more involved. There's some real dedication and work involved there. Um, so that's that's something to keep in mind. It's not it's not just the one-off working that you're doing. So. It should it should be pop culture that you that you really that that you enjoy, but also that it's it's pop culture that speaks to you on a spiritual level. I I mean I enjoy a lot of pop culture. I don't necessarily work with all of it magically because the magical work should be something that speaks to it, it should be something that speaks to me spiritually. And if it doesn't speak to me spiritually, if it's just something I enjoy, then that's how I'm going to. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to enjoy it instead of trying to create a magical system out of it. That makes sense. So my last question for you has really nothing to do with pop culture magic, but I was wondering if you could, well, I guess it does in a way because you reference it, you reference your system of space time magic throughout this book. And I'm pretty unfamiliar with that. I was wondering just because it piqued my curiosity, you know, space time magic sounds pretty cool. If you could just tell us a little bit about what that is. Um, sure. Well, um, I've written a book about it called Space Time Magic, and actually written a bit written a bit further about it in my book Magical Identity as well. But Space Time Magic is basically a system of magic that looks at how to work with space and time as variables in your magical working, and how to manipulate them in order to achieve results. And in some cases, it's 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 also drawing on disciplines such as physics and and anthropological explorations of time and space in order to see how we can take those particular structures and apply them to magical work. And so that's what space time magic is about. Uh, an example of that would be a, a technique that I've developed would be actually the the comic book sigil technique, um, which is a space time magic working. Where what I did is I took comic book panels. Um, I, I'd read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, and he um, he does a really good job of breaking down how comic books work and how people read comics. And from that, I was like, okay, well, if that's how people read comics, let's take that apart and actually turn it into a magical working. And so the idea is that you create a couple different panels, and you put inside each panel a sigil, and then uh, that represents a specific result that you want to manifest. And so they can be different results, but each each panel has a sigil. And then you connect them together, and the idea is that through the charging and firing of those sigils, what you're doing is you're you're creating momentum um, in space and time where when one result manifests, it basically serves to pull the other ones through into reality so that they manifest shortly after. And so that's an example of space-time magic that I write about in space-time, in the book Space-Time Magic. Is this something that would pair well with pop culture magic if you maybe chose a, a science fiction piece of pop culture to work with? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly could. You could certainly give that a try and see what happens. You know, it, it, the thing you'd have to keep in mind, again, is is the is the pop culture's explanation of how space and time work, something that you really want to work with. So, I mean, that's kind of the other the other thing to factor in there with that. But it, it could certainly be a viable uh a viable thing to explore. Hmm, yeah, I, I think that would be maybe an interesting uh, combination to pursue. So, but the book Taylor is pop culture magic systems. It's like you said, the third book that you've written completely dedicated to pop culture magic. You have the couple grimoires that you mentioned as well. So, if people want to learn more about your books and yourself, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at magicalexperiments.com. 
which has a list of my books on the page. So you can find out about those and, and get them. And of course, you can find my books on Amazon and in independent um, occult bookstores and other places. So feel free to go check them out. Absolutely, man. I highly recommend it. Like I mentioned, I hadn't read the first two, but I read this one, and now I have to go back and complete the series because I'm, I'm pretty interested in working with it now, and uh, I do appreciate you being here and talking to us a little bit about it. So, Taylor Elwood, thanks for your time, man. Thank you. To Ron Talegra, my thanks again to Taylor Elwood. Check him out at MagicalExperiments.com and get your pop culture magic on. His book is also linked in the show notes. You know, I'd like to get my pop culture magic on for real. Harry Potter seems like an obvious, easy starting point. Maybe something uh, like Game of Thrones too. You know, I was talking to Miguel Connor earlier while I was editing this episode. Miguel, of course, the host of the wonderful Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. And he always makes me think of Westworld. He's always splicing clips of that into his intros. Westworld would be a cool, uh, rather unique piece of pop culture to work with, methinks. I don't know how well it would work necessarily, but that'd be a cool magical experiment. I am a book lover, though, so creating a system based on some favorite novels of mine would be cool. House of Leaves, you guys have heard me talk about that before. I'm a Catch-22 nerd, so working with someone like Yosarian would be cool. Or how about A Confederacy of Dunces? Ignatius J. Riley would be quite the trip to communicate with. How about Fight Club? Tyler Durden bringing more of that Gnostic vibe. Maybe The Spirit of Valus. Maybe some more classic shared universes, like a... Like a Mark Twain shared magical universe. Ooh, or a Charles Dickens. Uh, the possibilities are endless indeed. You know what else is endless? Me pandering to you for support. You know the spiel. Please rate and review on iTunes, share the show with other like-minded folks, or even folks who think magic is David Blaine stuff. And of course, if you're really in the holiday spirit, throw some bones my way at oculturepodcast.com slash support. Hey, I also have a t-shirt update for those of you who've inquired. Uh, I unpacked... The first batch yesterday, that was Friday, December 1st, and it's a limited amount. I worked with an Etsy store owner uh, from the Phoenix, Arizona area. His name is Scott Mist. His work is awesome, and it's linked in the show notes, his Etsy store is. If you're interested in the stuff he's done, he helped me get this first batch printed, and I think they turned out so well. They're so fucking comfortable. The shirts are black, tri-blend, with the logo of the show, and the font underneath it. You can see some pictures uh, on our social media if you want to check out what they look like. Scott uses environmentally safe and sound practices, uh, some water-based inks, I think. He's doing it right, let's put it that way. I was thinking about getting a higher quality shirt to start with. I mean, these tri-blends are really high quality, but I was thinking of getting like organic cotton or organic bamboo or hemp even, and I figured, eh, for the first round of shirts here, I just want to Keep it simple, and then we'll see how popular they are, how many sell, and then maybe down the road we'll introduce some new designs and some new fabrics. But anyways, I hope to have the online store up soon. I'm not sure exactly how I want to do that yet. you think I'd have figured that out, but I haven't. However, if you don't want to wait for my lazy ass to get that done, shoot me an email, oculturepodcast at gmail.com, or hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, MySpace, Friendster, uh, AIM, ICQ, wherever. And we can work something out and make a great holiday gift to yourself. But like I said, limited batch to start with. And I'll tell you what, I am already in the holiday spirit too. And we've got a big, huge final month of 2017 on the way. Usually I try to post about four episodes a month or once a week. So sometimes it's five depending on how it shakes out. But this month we've got six episodes in the queue taylor here was the first one up and there's five more coming your way before the end of the year and there's some of the better ones i've done i think and i can't wait to share them with you guys one of them specifically is a dream come true it's a wet dream and another one activated something so primal inside me it violated a feel spot so deep inside me that I have no choice but to transmit that creamy contagion to you. And more on that when the time comes. Anyway, I've reached my quota of sexual innuendo for this episode, so I gotta get out of here before I get got. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.
Yeah.